Hi everyone, this is Chris Simpson from the Stage Left Podcast and coming up we have 90 minutes with the comedian and writer Stuart Lee. Um, genius is an overused word but there are plenty who have described our guest today as just that. Uh, and what we hear is Stuart deconstructing his creative processes and describing in detail how specific musicians uh, and particular genres of music have influenced those creative processes um, and his approach to performance too. Uh, it's really interesting in this episode how those two arts align. Um, when Stuart confirmed he would be appearing I sent a, a message to my good friend uh, Matt McClouch, he was the person who got me into Stuart's work years ago um, and he replied that I'd need to listen to a lot of the fall in preparation for the interview as Stuart was known to be a very big fan of theirs uh, and specifically Mark e. Smith. Uh, so I spent a week listening to their back catalogue and, and interviewed Stuart on the 22nd of January. Uh, just 48 hours later the news broke that uh, Mark e. Smith, the singer and songwriter of the fall, uh, had sadly passed away. Um, so we released this with Stuart's blessing and it's a really poignant listen um, hearing Stuart glowing about how Mark e. Smith changed his life um, and the potential impact of a world without the fall. Our next episode is with the Ivan Novella winning songwriter Ian Dench, uh, who as well as writing international hits such as Unbelievable with EMF, um, has written um, five songs of Beyonce in the studio, which has seen him nominated uh, for Golden Globes and, and Grammys. Um, and he goes into a lot of detail about the craft and, and, and how to compose songs, knowing that they will be heard by a colossal mass audience. It's, it's an interesting listen. Um, for more episodes featuring Tony Visconti and what it was like recording David Bowie's vocals on Black Star, uh, Wolfgang Fleur of Craftwork on the moment they stumbled upon creating the first uh, electronic drum set, um, Richard Fortas of Guns N' Roses uh, on the jokes that Axl Rose tells on the talkback mics on stage, um, Nick Cave's Baddest Seed, George Fajestica on working with Australia's finest, uh, and Shane Keister uh, on recording at Graceland and touring as Elvis Presley's pianist. Uh, go to the stage of podcast.com, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, uh, and let us know where you're listening from uh, on Twitter at the Stage of Pod and Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Stage of Podcast. So here we go, this is Stuart Lee. Okay, welcome to a very special episode of the Stage Left Podcast. This podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. Cited by the likes of Ricky Gervais and James Corden as influence, um, you can enter in your own punchline there. Uh, today we have the most critically acclaimed uh, British comedian of his generation, the BAFTA award winning Stuart Lee, who, as well as tearing up every convention around stand up comedy for the past 15 years, is an accomplished musician and songwriter um, who won four Laurence Olivier Awards for his role in the creation of Jerry Spring of the Opera, has written innumerable music reviews of obscure artists, and who recently performed on a tribute record to Shirley Collins. Um, today we'll be finding out about Stuart's creative processes, we'll be revisiting a prevalent theme on the stage their podcast about how artistic output is valued in the digital age, um, what it was like being the band down Murray, if it's really true that Stuart named his hamster Karlheinz Stockhausen, and we'll be holding Stuart to account for the creation of Friends Ferdinand. So it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Stage of Podcast is none other than Stuart Lee. Can I just say, you've sort of a musician and I feel that is, that is pushing a bit. <laughs> I, basically, I can do modal improvisations in D on a, on a conventionally tuned guitar, right? That's, and that's um, about as far as it gets. Although uh, what I've been lucky with is I've worked with a lot of musicians who've allowed me to sort of piggyback around on their um on their thing but i think uh <laughs> i think it's the same a musician would be pushing it I've, I've you know i've appeared in some music yeah and also the four olivier awards you know that was for the whole that was for the, the whole, whole thing, thing. Right? it was it wasn't like I, I personally didn't i don't think i got one i i was i was nominated for to, for best director of a west end musical and i was really pleased that I didn't win it because I knew I would then have been asked questions about what I'd how I'd done it mm. and I'd just winged it so much <laughs> that I knew that I didn't want to if I'd won it I would have been exposed as a just chancing fraud basically I think so. it'd be interesting to see how you work because it's Richard Thomas you worked with yeah, yeah. Is that right? yeah so we're interesting to discuss that but firstly the first collaboration I'd like to discuss is something that you mentioned uh, yesterday in NASCAR I, wrote, uh, I read sorry yeah. um, about Bristol Fashion which is was it a Capri battery is that right? yeah well about a year ago this um uh, f free improvisation sort of noise jazz uh, trio. Matt Lord, the guy, uh, sent me an email, and he uh, he sent me a link to some of their stuff, um, which I liked actually. I thought it was really good. And he said, um, "Do you want to do you know an hour in the studio with us to see what happens?" And um, he couched it very cleverly because normally I'm very I'm very cautious about things but um there was absolutely no strings attached i was going to bristol anyway and they could get there from exeter and they had a studio they could use in bristol so having never met before i turned up and uh we just did this we did about an hour of stuff about 40 minutes of which 50 minutes of which they've released yesterday mm. um i had 
I had a bit of paper with some quotes from um, various documentaries about Birmingham. Okay. Um, I had an idea of doing something about the history of Birmingham. And uh, then I sort of thought maybe I'd do something about my annoying neighbours when I lived, where I lived 10 years ago, mm. about my wife having a whooping cough over the summer and uh, a ghost that I once saw and about trying to die out on the road. Well, I didn't have anything written down. Yeah. I just thought, well, there are things I can... There are things I... I can talk about, but I've also got a sort of musicality to them because I thought about this coughing sound mm. and then the sort of repetition of trying to eat the same food from service stations every day yeah, and stuff like that. So, and I, I didn't really know when, when I really enjoyed it. it, I, I've, it was, it's amazing to stand in the middle of incredibly talented people and, mm. and li listen to them. I, I, so was I, it recorded live or did you? Yeah, it was all oh, right, okay, right. live, yeah. I mean, we're in and out in an hour. Oh right. Yeah, and um, I've done a, did a similar thing with Mark Westall recently. who's in a, a free improviser, and he's wanted to do something around some a poem that the, uh, the 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 free jazz drummer John Stevens had written about twenty years, twenty five years ago, thirty years ago, and um, he sort of stood me in the middle of a load of musicians, and I tried to fit this poem in around what they were doing. I mean, that is a, it's a great thing to do, but I'm where I'm in these situations I'm a sort of resource I've done it with um, Steve Beresford and Tanya Chen as well on a John Cage piece in Determinacy yeah, you know, where, you do that yeah I mean yeah. it's kind of ongoing that, but, that, but there's, in fact there's a, a really good film version of it in preparation at the moment but really I think why they ask me is because they know that I like that sort of music so I'm not going to be freaked out by it yeah. and, um, and I also know that sometimes it doesn't work and mm. uh, so it's not it's not embarrassing and I can and you know I can I can I can speak clearly <laughs> into a microphone, but the Caffrey battery thing, I don't know what to, I don't know what people will make of it. I mean, the, the, my, my I worry for them because that certain people will come to it via me who mm. won't like that sort of thing and will be horrified by it or find it ludicrous. But on the other hand, it might drive some other people towards it. I mean, you listen back to it; it was all improvised in the moment. You think, oh, if I could do it again, I'd do that a bit differently. But then it wouldn't be. What it is, you yeah. Know. There's a there's a sort of twenty seven minute track that that all, all of which all of what I do in it, I'm quite happy with. Apart from a bit between about five and eight minutes in, where I really lose my way and make loads of stupid choices, I think. And I said to Matt, "Can we just lift that out?" And he went, "We well, can't really because we were getting somewhere playing off what you were doing, mm. and and then it would sort of it would be dishonest. So you know, but, 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 but I mean." He's now saying, do you want to do another one? And I wouldn't mind, but I, I don't know what happens with these sorts of things, you know. So it was good fun. Polly on the Shore, you did yeah. a cover of that. Um, is it true that you went and interviewed Shirley Collins first and she didn't know that people were talking about it on the internet? Oh, well, this group? was a long time ago. The oh. first time I interviewed Shirley Collins was um, probably about... It might, might have been 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And I went, and she was... There wasn't much out on CD then. I think mm -hmm. there was a. I would have gone to talk to her for the Sunday Times, at my suggestion, because there was either a book coming out that she'd written about being a song collector in a, in the fifties, going to America and mm -hmm. trying to collect all the old folk songs when she was young, or Fledgling, which is a folk indie, may have been putting out a box set of her stuff. And at this point, nothing was out there, and um, I I bought a couple of the albums on spec from her. Junk, you know, second-hand shop in Stoke Newington in the like late nineties, and mm. one of them had become. But yeah, she wasn't. Everyone used to say that at the time that was a fan of hers, that she wasn't really aware that um, that that she was remembered at all, and she, and partly why she lost her voice is because of a loss of confidence really? in herself. Yeah, oh. it's a psycho psychosomatic thing, really. So um, yeah, then the, singing that song was just again about five, six years ago. I went to this symposium in Oxford about the folk song. I'm, I, I'm sort of attached to this college in Oxford where every now and again they asked me to do things about creative writing with kids, which is a real privilege actually. Mm. And they said, well, you go to this thing because the kids are trying to write stuff in the style of ballads or whatever. And we've got Shirley Collins to talk at it, um, which was great. So I went and what I'd sort of forgotten was that everyone attending in the spirit of the evening was supposed to try and do a folk song. And the only folk song I knew how to play was Polly on the Shore, because it's like D... Was it in D, yeah. D, G and A, yeah. 
basically. And I and when I used to be in a in a psychedelic um, jam band that only ever did three gigs, we, and dust harvey. Yeah, we did that because <laughs> you could you could you could take the middle eight, you know, and sort mm. of throw everything at it and then you could still get back to the, the thing you know that's all we were ever looking for really when we did and um and I, but I didn't have an instrument and someone had got a little tiny guitar there and there was a bloke i'd met before called uh called stewart there who um who uh played the concertina and i went can that is that in d and he went yeah <laughs> i went can you play if i do this d g a can you and he went yeah yeah and so we just did it and um people were sort of spellbound by it and i think Partly it was because it appealed to what Shirley likes, which is it was utterly unaffected because it didn't have time to be. You know, mm. we hadn't had time to think about how to perform it or interpret it. And so it did what she likes, which mm. is that the song itself was much bigger than the performer. Mm. And she, her skill, I think, is she, she tries to make herself almost anonymous. And then she said she'd said in an unguarded moment in an interview that she loved it when I first did it. But then as I kept being asked to do it at these Shirley Collins events, she said it got worse and worse. The more that I, <laughs> <laughs> the more that I thought about it, the worse it got until it wasn't that good in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and what you, you, but, you touch upon uh, Dust Half there? So that was a band that you did only three gigs. With. What were your fondest memories of that? I mean, what were you trying? Nothing. To I mean, like it? you know, look, it was I was a student in. And there was um, there used to be a lot of little gigs in our college where there'd be student bands and real bands, and I was friends with a couple of people that were in other bands, and I went again. That was just sort of started as it was basically sort of jamming on really simple chords mm. where you could then do like little modal improvisations, and um, you know, I mean, but then the thing is, we got to London. We all loads of us went to London, sort of eighty nine, ninety, to try and do various things. Which is what you used to do then, which is probably the most relevant thing to your podcast is people I knew that wanted to do music and comedy or writing or whatever, you could go to a major city, you could go on Enterprise Allowance Scheme, which was a Tory thing to fiddle the figures, the unemployment figures, but you got 40 quid a week or something and you had to prove that you were trying to do something. Right, okay. And then you were taken out of the unemployment figures because you were uh, trying to be a, a professional garden designer or something, even though you weren't. It meant you weren't technically unemployed, you yeah. were... You were a failed garden designer <laughs> rather than an unemployed person, right? So, and you could do that, you could get little temp jobs. And, and a lot of the jobs I did then were the sorts of jobs now that would be an unpaid internship because you'd be lucky to have the experience, you know. And then, and we all lived in cheap shared houses where we tried to do things. And the house I lived in was, um, was uh, the first couple of houses I lived in were all people that were trying to do acting, writing, or music. And as it happened, I did try to do some, some music, but the stand-up circuit was much more straightforward, right? For a start, you didn't have to get a drum kit to a place. You just had to get yourself. You didn't have to, the, people were much more friendly. Yeah. But like I found being on with other bands a few times I did it, it was real hostility and sort of, you didn't have to prove that you'd taken a certain amount of people through the door. Mm. And, um, and, and also, once you'd got on a bill, if there were four of you and a promoter, and a hundred people came through the door and they paid two pound each. It was then split five ways and it just, mm. next thing you knew it was right. But the, but the part, part of why that, so that's why I didn't really go down the music road. Also with stand up, I felt like I was starting to develop a style of my own, whereas my technical limitations in music meant that all I would ever do really was play in the style of people that I liked, which at that point was things like the Dream Syndicate and Green on Red and those sort of early eighties American sort of roots rock psychedelic revival type groups and um so you know that's that's why i did a stand up but we what we're talking about is the last period i think where people that wanted to be musicians or all sorts of other things could go to a metropolitan center and sort of hook up with people and and it it wasn't exclu it, it wasn't so much to preserve that lifestyle as it is now of people with a bit of f f f parental money to help them out mm. or a lucky break, you know. And I think, it, I mean, I was watching an interview with a new punk band that someone said, you'll like this lot and we should go and see some people that are under 40 at some point. And well, I did like them and we are going to go and see them, but they're all called like Jeremy and things like that. And that's really <laughs> weird, you know. And, like and all their sentences go up at the end. And just, it's, I mean, it's like a, it's becoming like a sort of middle class hobby, yeah. you know. Well, um, one thing that you touched upon there about parental money and that kind of thing was, 
we have a lot of people, young musicians, who are going into the music industry, and at the time when they need the most kind of backing and support is when they're most vulnerable to quitting. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you've said in the past that members of your family, uh, a lot of people in your family are kind of embarrassed, this is a quote from you, but like, embarrassed or baffled by the fact that you do stand up. Yeah. And um, like a lot, like so your mother said, um, yeah. she wanted you, like, you could go and do cruise ships and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. How was it a case that you didn't actually kind of um, bow into that kind of approval that they, you might have wanted from them? Because well, it's difficult to- Look, you know, I mean, I was from I was from a lower middle class background and a single parent family. My mum left school at fourteen, and she would have loved to have gone to college. And she, in fact, did teacher training stuff at night school and ended up as a sort of teacher of secretarial stuff at night school. So she sort of, you know, yeah. she moved up through the ranks for one of a better work, better way of putting it. When I got a place at university, her she thought brilliant. This means now my son will be a middle class professional who doesn't have to worry about. Mm. his future and so to choose not to do that and to choose to do to be try and be a comedian was I think frightening and a li- not a little bit appeared ungrateful and also irrational mm. you know and um, also don't forget then in 1989 we were only sort of 10 years into alternative comedy there was no obvious career model for it there weren't people playing stadiums yeah. people weren't even really on telly and I knew that and what what my logical end point for being an alternative comedian in 1989 was much the same as it would be if I decided to be a folk singer. It would be, could I get a 25-day tour once a year of 150-seater art, art centres? That was, you yeah. know, that was the top end of it, and that would have been fine, because mm-hmm. people's overheads weren't much then. Of course, now what's happened is um, you, you meet people on the circuit who are young, and their parents um, have seen that it's a big thing and are actually mm. ridiculously supportive and, and come along with them and offer to manage them and yeah, drive yeah, them yeah. to gigs. And it's the same, I think... With comic books, right, people have said that, you know, writing for Marvel Comics in the 70s, you were like a pothead acid dropout Mm. um, trying to do subversive work within what was thought of as an infantile medium. Mm. Whereas now Harvard graduates want to write for Marvel because they want to be making those Hollywood films. It's a respectable thing. So actually, on on the one hand, though it's nice when your field becomes a a respectable thing, on the other hand, the best work's often done when it isn't. Because you're you're ignored, and um, you know, so it is funny with my family. My my, my I'm just you know, you got to think I'm not on the radar of most people, even though I can do a quarter of a million people on tour. Mm. I'm not most most people don't know who I am. I got picked up by I got in a cab the other night, and the bloke said, "What have you been doing?" I said, "I'm doing a stand up gig. Are oh, you a comedian? Yeah. Where are you? Leicester Square Theatre. Oh yeah. What one off is it? No, I'm there for six months. Really." He goes, I see him stand up all the time. I go and see so and so, and all people you'd heard of, Lee Mack, Mickey Flanagan. He had never heard of me. And by the end of the journey, he kept saying to me, Have you been on telly? And I was going, Yeah. I think he thought I was just a loony, just <laughs> like lying. Um, like when you meet people who tell you they've invented the hovercraft and they yeah. were never paid for yeah. it, or, <laughs> or they were a member of Duran Duran or something. So you is know. there any part of you that wants to. Because you kind of go against that. All, a lot of your kind of comedy is kind of counter well, the, the the mainstream way, the lead back kind of stuff you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, is there part of you, little percentage of you, that wants that kind of? Well, there's right. I I don't like being known. Mm-hmm. I don't like the inconvenience of being known. Last night we went out round here, round Kings Cross, with the kids ten and seven to look at this installations they've got round here at the moment of art made from light, and it was lovely. Except about every ten minutes. Very nice people come over and say that they like your work. That is odd for a child. And actually, at the end of last night, which she'd never done before, my seven-year-old said to me, what is it that you do for a living, really? It it had just got to the point where it was weird for her, you Mm. know, that everyone knew who her dad was. She was going, do you know that man? No. You know, and um, and being known has created problems with the children. At my son's first school, I know there were parents who wouldn't let their kids play with him because they thought what I did was degenerate and vile and in poor taste, you know. Because mm-hmm. they'd hear you're a comedian, they'd Google a little bit, yeah. see it out of context. And also, the, one of the first things that come up if you Google me is a massive article by uh, Dominic something in The Telegraph, mm-hmm. essentially saying I'm a psychopath, you know, because he doesn't really get the fact that the yes. it is an act, yeah. you know. and. Um, so it's it's massively inconvenient. I feel I've been very lucky that I've actually worked out partly by design and a balance between actually making quite a good living out of it and not really being known. Yeah. But to go to the spot, yeah, to go like to the next level, yeah. I would have to be known. And in fact I did have a little bit of jealousy a couple of days ago when I saw 
uh, there are a number of people that have just had sort of Netflix specials announced and um, and uh, none of them are as critically acclaimed as me no. and and some of them don't even do the figures that I do but they're the sort of people that they're on things and they're there are adverts for them on the tube whereas when Netflix came to see me they said that this tour was too sort of parochial and I, I understand that but if I went on programmes and did chat shows and stuff or advertised I don't even advertise really because I don't need to then they'd sort of be more aware of you but actually the trade off between that and the relative freedom of not being known probably isn't worth it and all those other ones will probably I know you said about jealousy but all those other people will probably would love the critical claim that you do get. So yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, well, it's, it's it's. I mean, in a way, it, the, the 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 not not being a household name is a saving grace of the act because you've seen it. And on some level, what's funny about it is the bloke on stage who is me <laughs> um, seems to feel that he's been hard done by in some way, which allows him to be rude about James Corden or whatever. Yeah. If I was properly famous, then that just totally wouldn't work because the yeah. status levels would be all wrong. And I like this about, you know, I like this. I, I'm afraid I'm that sort of person that I've still got that rather childish thing about me where when your favourite band become massive, you think, oh, they won't be able to do this and that kind of thing anymore. What I don't do now is begrudge them the money. When the, when the Fall song was used in an advert mm. 15 years ago, the teenage me would have gone, oh, sell out. And now I thought, well, I hope they get loads of money from it, mm. you know, and, and it's a bit easier for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's... a uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to manage, to micromanage. Um, you did a really interesting documentary about the Pueblo clowns. On the radio, yeah. On the yeah, radio, yeah, I listened yeah. to it the other day. Oh, and there's, you've it's, really done your research, yeah, it's man. amazing. Um, they, they was a really, um, there was a fantastic quote in it from one of the people you interviewed, which said, about the clown face or the clown mask, it's not a mask to hide behind, it's a window to look through. Right. So when you become Stuart Lee, the character on stage, do you think you get a different vantage point looking through those eyes? Yeah. And what do well, you I see also, differently? Well, I, well I, I, what, it's sort of the other way around as well. I get, to, I get to, to do and say things that I probably wouldn't myself, and I get to behave uh, irresponsibly and irrationally and to give vent to my annoyances that obviously we try to hold in all the time. In fact, something irritating happened yesterday, and I was moaning about it. And then I thought, oh, it doesn't matter, because I can just do... <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what it was. We had a little kids' party for my daughter, and my uh, wife had... We stayed up till three in the morning because we got in from the gig. We were both, my wife's a stand up as well, yeah. Bridget, and we got in about 11 o'clock midnight from the gig, and my kids' party was 10 in the morning. And then we made a cake, right? Because you've got to make a cake. Yeah. So we made a cake until three in the morning. We made this cake, multi layered rainbow cake. And then we took it to the kids' party, and one of the little girls went, <laughs> came up and went, Your cake was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then we surfed, which went, I didn't really mind, but I thought, oh, what's the ethics now? Because are we supposed to tell the parent? Because yeah. I don't really want I thought it was quite funny. Because I was dead on my feet, you know. I'd like, yeah. and, but actually, she'd probably tell him so she doesn't say it to another parent yeah. who might be more sensitive, you know. And then I thought, you know what, it doesn't matter because actually all you want to do is to be able to get this off your chest. But you can, you can do it down the line in some routine. And I think all the, often when I'm in some situation that's unravelling badly or is weird, I think, well, down the line, this will become a thing. And one of the problems in my life now is it's fairly balanced. Uh, I don't get in lots of odd situations, um, and th often they're the things that give you ideas. But, I mean, look, it is... I, I, I didn't used to think there was a difference between the me on stage and me, and then the last it's five the last years... It's the last few years you've seen more and more, yeah. I felt it might partly be from going to those to see the Pueblo clans. I mean, it was a big deal for me... I'd read a lot about Native American clowns, and um, I think it's a terrible cliche of the Western artist that he um, that he that he projects his own anxieties onto some other culture, and then mm. tries to see and kind of invests in them some sort of wisdom that we don't have. But I do think in this case it was absolutely true. There was something brilliant about the the, 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 the philosophy of the Native American clowns, particularly in the Pueblos, where they do these two or three days a year, where they take over the whole village and they. You don't know who they are, and they study the tensions of the village all year, and they are, basically their thing is to overthrow them. Yeah. And uh, for those three days, and it's it's kind of felt it's almost like a vaccination for the town, you know, like sort of a like a you'll reject the poison if you're made to eat it, you know. Mm. And um, though, and and they are very much in character, in as much as 
no one knows who they are. It's a secret society, and they secretly rehearse in these caves called kivas. Yeah. And I was told, this is a brilliant thing, right? I was told, no one will speak to you about this, right? The, so the clowns aren't allowed to say anything about who they are. Right, I understand that. The reason they don't do that is because 100 odd years ago, when the white Americans first went in, 150 years ago, they really got the wrong end of the stick about these things, and they had them closed down for being obscene. And so they don't talk to anyone, and they, do, they don't really let people go. There's only the Tewa in uh, Taos that let people in. So I wrote, uh, but I was put in touch by the village with um, the editor of the local Native American newspaper, who said that after the event, well, he would talk to me, and he would tell me as much as he felt the clowns would be prepared to let me know. Yeah. Right. So I went to this event in this village, you know, they all come, at midday, they all come over the roofs, down these, like, they're like steps, the buildings, you know. Mm. And they're in these black and white masks, painted faces and little straw loincloths, and they, 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 th they, they make the fat bloke walk across a little narrow bridge so he falls in the river. They go down on their knees worshipping this disabled old woman saying they all want to marry her. They make the most beautiful girl wear different sized shoes so she falls over. It's all... Mm. And they kept coming up to me with my notebook and throwing it on the floor and stamping on it. Mm. I thought, that's interesting. And then taking... If I was drinking, they would take the drink off me. You're not allowed to drink alcohol on the, mm. website, on the website, on the reservation, obviously, but any drink, they'd take it off me and do a big pantomime throwing it away as if they were judging me for what I was drinking in the same way as the perception of the Native Americans they've got a drink problem. So mm. I mean... Then the next day, I went to the Native American newspaper office, talked to this bloke, the editor of it. He was really guarded and difficult. Until he found out, it came up. He said, it's a bit, what we do, so it's not that different to a stand-up satirist like Bill Hicks, right? And I went, oh, I was on with Bill Hicks once. And he went, what? And then he thought that was a big deal, but it wasn't actually because he was just like doing gigs in Edinburgh and I was on a benefit with him. Mm. To be honest, I didn't even watch him because he came out and start going about smoking, and I thought I was another of those Americans yeah. to talk about smoking, <laughs> which is hilarious to think, yeah. like the man who didn't sign yeah. the Beatles, you know. <laughs> anyway, but then he found out I was a comic, and he really opened up. Um, but he did, still didn't tell me that much, but enough, you know. Then, about five years later, I, I get asked to do loads of talks for places, and I, I normally always do them for educational places, and I don't charge anything, because... I think if you if you take all the offers and you don't charge anything, it doesn't really matter where you do. So it's quite interesting sometimes to go to somewhere you wouldn't normally go. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I got asked to do a talk at this little kid's school. Um, As you lead the character? No, <laughs> no. So, yeah, about like yeah. I was I say I'll do the I'll talk about the clowns. I've talked about Native American clowns at Trinity College Dublin at Dublin Art School at the Slade. And I've talked about it to infants, to five-year-olds wow. as well. Okay. Right, you can always find a way of... So I was talking to all these five-year-olds, and I told them about that. And then, this little girl about five went, you know the clown that threw your notebook on the floor? I went, yeah. She said, do you think he was the same bloke as the newspaper editor the next day? And I went, yeah, he was. <laughs> and I hadn't realised. Yeah. He had the same build, right? He was the head, he was the chief clown. Mm. And what, why did he know that I was a, writing mm. about it? Because I wasn't allowed to take audio in, so I had to have a notebook. But he knew that there was a reporter there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he, he set me up. And then the next day, he interviewed me. He allowed <laughs> me to interview him. And yet we'd interacted. It was definitely the same it's guy. Same guy. Yeah, yeah, and how funny is that? Yeah. That's the best. And it's a joke that took five years to... <laughs> the bloke saying, no, yeah. we c you can't possibly meet any of us. Yeah. It's too secret. But he did, he did <laughs> meet me. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, talking about the different character that you go into on stage, yeah. do you have to get yourself into the role in any way? So James Gandolfini, who played um, Tony Soprano, used to say that if he was pissed off or angry, he would uh, deliberately not have sleep the night before, in, in his role I'm talking about, so he deliberately is uh, uh, not have sleep the night before and put a stone in his shoe that morning and walk about, walk about, so when it came to the scene that he was really, really pissed off. Well, um, yeah. do, do you have to get into the role? Of well, um, I, probably, I probably do around the start of developing a new show, right, because I... I'm working out the stuff. Mm. But then now at the moment, for example, I'm in a, I'm in a, the last month of a six month run at Leicester Square Theatre, the show, the show starts at seven. Mm. I live in London, in Hackney, and it's in central London. 
So I get the kids from school about 4.30, I get them home, I make their tea, try and get their homework started, I hand them over to the babysitter at 5.45, I get to Finsbury Park Tube and I get into the theatre about quarter to seven, mm -hmm. 20 to seven, I have a shower, change, write my notes on my hand, and then I walk pretty much straight out. Yeah. So pre preparing is a luxury that I don't have. Mm. But actually what then happens is when I finally get on stage, the previous two and a half hours have been such a panic and so full of so full of responsibility that actually arriving on stage is hugely relaxing and I think, right, I can I can uh, just do what I want now for two and a half hours. It's quite interesting. Mm. But sometimes you do use what's around you. For example, in December, um, there's a comedian called Robin Ince who's brilliant yeah. and he's he's def defined a generation of comics without being a household name in as much as he sort of showed us that you could do stuff about anything and he started trying to run nights with themes about science yeah, or yeah. books or whatever. That's the infinite monkey cage, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah monkey cage, yeah. Well, he was sort of, he, he did that and then he got sort of stiffed for the telly because he'd been doing it with um, that scientist, Brian, Brian Cox, Cox yeah. and then they did a kind of TV thing like it but swapped it out for Dara O'Brien who's like a better, oh, is that what I, better oh. name. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't officially done but Stop really it was, what, yeah, it was Robin. And, and, but anyway, so at Christmas we were doing this thing and it was comedians and a astronauts and scientists and... Like, as always happens with these things, there's not too many people on the bill. The shortest bit I've got at the moment is like about 15 minutes on Brexit. I haven't really got short routines. Mm. So I was going to do that. And then they were saying, can you cut it down a bit? I thought, well, I don't know what to do. And I was just standing in the wings. And I realised that really I needed to do six minutes. And I just didn't know what to do. There were loads of astronauts on stage. And they were, they were, they were kind of really, they were proper astronauts that had been in space, but they... They were fa at Hammersmith Apollo. They were failing to sell the excitement of being in space. Somehow, yeah. it was interesting to have been in space, but to make that not interesting yeah. was quite, <laughs> uh, <laughs> quite <laughs> a skill, right? And um, but at the same time, Dara O'Brien was talking to me. And Dara O'Brien's like the sort of mayor of the town of comedy, right? So he likes to let you know that he's got he's like. And he was we were talking about touring and stuff, and he he seemed to be wanting to let me know that he'd done certain sized rooms and it was all a bit sort of I like him right but it was all a bit sort of weird yeah. so I had that in one ear like some kind of competition about who was the best mm. and then the astronauts were on stage and so I I, wa I walked out and I hadn't had time to think of what to do I knew I couldn't do what I'd planned but as I was going across the stage when I'd been introduced as the astronauts were passing by me I sort of thought I, I sort of used both of these things and I did this sort of seven minutes off the top of my head about how astronauts were really boring and like self-aggrandizing <laughs> and that it was easy to go into space and what was much harder was to do an Edinburgh Fringe show and stuff like that <laughs> and that it's easy to go into space with NASA because that's corporate like being with Avalon or Phil McIntyre and the hard thing to do was to go into space just on your own like I'd done <laughs> I'd just gone up on my own and like people going what do you eat in space do you have to have special food because all the astronauts going about hey, you have to have special food and I was going just take some beans you know and you're all right and, and like <laughs> and going, what about when you go to the toilet and the astronauts going oh you have to go in this special bag and I was going you just do it in your hand and then chuck it out of the window and stuff like that. But it was, and it was also because I was annoyed with Dara for like talking about the business of comedy in this yeah. like businessman kind of way and yeah. the astronauts had been boring. And so the two things just sort of came together. And I thought, but I could never repeat it because actually it was just about Those that exact feeling then. So, you know, you can do, you can do. And um, in terms of the, the, t the tone of the shows, I pretty much know from what kind of sound the audience make between the house music going down and the intro music starting, mm. whether I can go in like bang, high energy, or whether I've got to tickle them round to... Really? You yeah. Can tell that. Before I even walked out. And I say it to the to the guy who does the tech yeah. backstage. You can tell. Um, without giving away too many of your secrets, the creative writing uh, process... I don't um, mind. <laughs> well, I, I once went to one of your shows a few years ago, and... It was like you were in my head because, and you, I think you did this deliberately, that I think you said that you wrote a set and then you wrote what people would be thinking, their internal dialogue, yeah. and then wrote jokes about their internal dialogue. Yeah. And so it was almost like you mocking what I was thinking before yeah. I even completed that yeah, thought. Yeah. Um, you've talked about in the past, because obviously you worked with Rich Herring in the past and other people, now your collaborative processes that you quite kind of create split personality yeah. to create that dialogue. Yeah. You tell us a bit, about, bit more about that. Hey? Well, I think that... Um, I think that everyone does this to some extent. Um, I think we all do it, whatever our yeah. life, you know, we, we, you, you have to have 
a degree of self awareness to sort of question what it is you're doing. Mm. And um, one of the th- one of the nice things about working with another person as a writer or musician is that they can question your ideas and you sometimes improve them as a result of that. Yeah. You know. But it's also annoying working with other people <laughs> because you get half the money and um, you also have to be with them all the time. And they might not be very good at brushing their teeth, for example. Some people some people aren't. And it's a bit annoying having to smell that all the time. Yeah. And there's always tensions and stuff. But but um, so I think what 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 I've started doing, and I don't know when I started doing it, was I sort of question myself on stage, either literally, or I put an assumed question into the mouth of the audience, or I make them question what I'm doing to make me then do other things. Mm. Sometimes it gets a bit schizophrenic, like I'll start doing something that I know I don't know the way out of, right? Yeah. And I'll do it to myself, and I'm sort of watching myself doing it and thinking, how's he gonna get out of this, the twat? You know, and it's quite funny, like, seeing yourself, but that's something I've got. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm a musician, but it's something I've got from watching musicians. It's something I've got from watching uh, Hal Gelb, who's in this country rock group, Giant Sand, who uses a lot of improvisation and likes to put himself at the extreme limit of his ability oh. to the point where you can often see him making himself and the people on stage laugh at the fact that they've got themselves into a corner and they have no idea how to get out of it. Wow. And also, more explicitly, from watching a lot of free jazz musicians and, and normal jazz musicians, actually, and anyone doing improvisations, where, um, where you, can, you can see them not trying to make problems for each other but trying to create... Mm. platforms and move them on to other things that's another reason I don't like the fake improvisation of panel shows because it's not collaborative mm. it's a, it's about a person trying to f- aggrandise themselves and it's never about the good of the programme as a whole or yeah. the thing as a whole so that, that's all from that and I, I, me- I remember seeing Fred Frith who was in um, Henry Cow a weird 70s proggy jazz group 25 years ago on his own at the ICA and I often talk about this I've probably said it before many times where he was noodling away on this guitar trying to and someone was taking photos with a flash and he went can you stop doing that because I'm up here trying to forget where I am and you keep reminding me where I am and so mm. you're trying to like not be the um, discredited journalist Toby Young gave me a bad review once <laughs> saying that I was so indifferent to the room they may as well not be there of course that's the wrong but he feigns indifference yeah because he he's trying to he thinks they don't know what they want another thing I saw it was really good in a free jazz thing. It was Derek Bailey, who I loved. Yeah. On stage at the Royal Festival Hall with Ruins, a Japanese duo. I listened to Carpool Tunnel the other day. Yeah, yeah. that's, well, yeah. now there's an interesting thing. We'll come to that. But yeah. he, was, he was playing an electric guitar and he wasn't looking where he was going and he walked backwards into the back wall of the Royal Festival Hall <laughs> and bumped into it and the guitar went clang. And all the sort of Royal Festival Hall people were worried about it. You could sort of see them thinking, oh no, this is embarrassing. But then what he did was he banged it again into the wall and then used the resonance of that as a oh. platform to start something else. So you can make you can make an accident into a thing. And that Carpal Tunnel album of Derek's, he, he thought he had um, Carpal Tunnel, which was, you know, when you get a, a, from repetitive, you know, injury, yeah. uh, but actually he'd got motor neuron disease, I think. Oh, really? But but um, it meant that he he couldn't do certain things on the guitar that he used to do. And so that album which he recorded all the pieces about three weeks apart as his condition is getting worse he was under the impression that he would recover because he thought it was carpal tunnel but he never did but he but he's basically in a dialogue with the disabled version of himself you know and and so he's kind of improvising with his own limitations and so sometimes it's fun to create limitations for yourself and like one of the things i do i think every artist should at least start with some sort of manifesto and one of the good things about when I started writing with Rich Herring in, when we were students, we wrote shows together, we sort of made a list of things we didn't want to do that we thought were cliches of comedy. Now, I don't know if there is a such thing as that anymore because I reckon there's always an interesting way of coming at an old thing. And certainly there's some dead riffs in rock and roll and then you suddenly think, oh, they've done that. Like, they've found something in that again, you know. But it was good to have to place restrictions on yourself because it meant you tried to be more creative within the parameters that you'd allowed yourself mm. you know do you miss then not working with someone else I mean or, or I mean do you say obviously your wife is a, a stand up yeah. comedian do you run ideas through her or well inevitably you talk about <laughs> them I mean the main problem we have is that 
we don't we don't spend a lot of time together at the moment because we're both working but you might have an experience together and there's something funny in it and you both find the same thing funny about it then you have to kind of decide who gets the who gets it <laughs> who takes it I don't I don't miss working with people um, and I don't think I would ever do it long term again but I get a lot of offers to drop in and out of little projects, most of which I've not been able to um, do because I've been so heavily doing stand-up the last 10, 15 years. But, you know, there's there's people that have talked about doing things that I'd do a short-term thing with, you know. Um, well, like those Capri Battery blokes. Well, I don't even... I can't even remember all their names. You know what I mean? <laughs> we were just in and out. It's so great. There was no... So nothing was... You know, so it's sort of... And then... But that's um, jazz, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, I know. Yeah. Just turn up. And then... Things come up. I mean, I would, there's things I'll do because I'm stopping stand up for a bit. There's odd little things I'll do, but really, what I'm 50 this year. I remember interviewing Julian Cope about 10 years ago, so he'd have been in his mid 40s. He said, "At the moment, I'm a has been, but if I can keep going past 50, up to no, if I can get in after 60, I become a legend." I thought, <laughs> "Yeah, that's really interesting." So I'm now in the sort of limbo between well he used to be on telly where is he now but go a little bit longer yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, he's not dead yeah <laughs> so and, I, and I, what I'm interested in now is what can you keep doing with with this with mm. if you write a new show every couple of years new to our show what and you stay in this narrow um, thing what how what can you find in it mm. what you know because have you already got ideas for what yeah, that might have? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because no one's really done that, right? Mm-hmm. George Carlin sort of did it in America. Mm-hmm. He didn't try to get on. He was in a sitcom, six episodes, it got cancelled, but he just kept going. And most of them don't. Most of them in the states don't really write. Louis C.K. was thought of as the most prolific person ever because mm-hmm. he wrote an hour a year, which pretty much all British comics do, yeah. you know. And um, so there's not much there's not really an American that's comparable to any most most of even the British stand ups I moan about and take the piss out of are better than most of the famous American ones. And here uh, you know, there's not many people who have the following or the inclination that enables them to keep coming up with new shows. Most people that have got the following that meant they could come up with it don't really want to do it. They want an easier mm. life. Or they want to do 20 dates around 8,000 seaters rather than really get the show into shape. Um, or people, a lot of people that could do that, like a Josie Long or whatever, that, are that, that have got the, the passion and the creativity for that, unfortunately they're not famous enough mm. to have the platform to be able to do it. So I'm in a unique position yeah, where yeah. I want to do it and I can. So mm. I thought, oh, well, I probably should um, just keep going. So, for listeners who aren't aware, um, Stuart was involved with Jerry Spring the Opera. I know that you kind of played down your involvement earlier, but you were theatre director and wrote well, what, the lyrics. Look, it was it was Richard Thomas, who was a, he was a, a musician who did com, com, comedy stuff, yeah. and then he had this idea of this thing. It was totally his idea. The, the 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 half hour of it that set the tone of it existed before I was ever involved. Yeah. He and he'd done a little three or four person workshop of it at Battersea Arts Centre. Which you once had saved your career back. Yeah, it Arsenal did. Well, be, you know, because it, as things started to get tight and I was going bankrupt and it couldn't, I couldn't. Well, it's that, but as, but as the Arsenal saved my career, and this will ring true with a lot of musicians. I was on the equivalent of a major label, mm. which was Avalon, that were a big promoter. And I got to the point, a bit like XTC at Virgin in the, in the early 90s, where mm. any further work I'd done with them would have incurred even more debt. Mm. So there was no way to move forwards with any kind of project without getting further into debt. You know what I mean? Like when you, you're never going to pay off the advance. You yeah. know what I mean? So um, I couldn't sort of work out how to develop work because all their models for developing work involve going to Edinburgh with them and losing 10 grand every summer. And, you know, so, and then Battersea Arts Centre had this thing where you could develop work there in front of an audience and they wouldn't charge you to use the facilities or whatever. Right. As long as you then did some little chat afterwards where... The public could go, Yo, why isn't there a cat in it or something like that? You know, and you'd go, well, I thought a dog might be better. And you had to like, you had to sort of uh, 
<laughs> make out you gave yeah. a toss about what they were saying <laughs> but it was it wasn't better than that it was good so he did that at Battersea Arts Centre and he basically asked me to help make a story out of it because it was like little sketches mm. and we used to sta- get people to help us out singing and stand it on its feet and I became the director of it sort of incrementally ah, right. I didn't really it was just that I used to organise the rehearsals <laughs> right, okay. somehow and the next thing I knew I was sort of directing it, but if someone had said to me, "Do you want to direct an opera?" I'd go, "Well, I can't do that." Yeah. But then I just sort of was, and then I, and then, it, and then the next thing I knew, five years later, I was still directing it, and I was at the National Theatre. That's crazy. <laughs> and that's the first time you've really done like theatre. Direction. Yeah, I directed that's, sort that's of mad. little things, right, but not. Okay. But, I mean, on look, that scale. I, mean, that's I know. Yeah, I had a lot of help. I mean, for a start, I had um, the designer of a piece was a bloke called Julian Crouch, who's from an experimental theatre company called Improbable, and his theatre designs basically sort of direct it in a way because they create spaces and I had an assistant director called Rob Thurtle who older viewers will remember as um, uh, he was an alien in um, Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct right. but uh, he uh, is that how he likes to be remembered <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I was, I was a national theatre there's a bloke right it's so massive you know there's a bloke his job is he's in charge of assistant directors and he organises um, he organises uh, a day when you have to interview all these people and all these people came in, and uh, I didn't really, you know, know what to do with any. And then Rob came in, and someone had said he should go. And he, he just really made me laugh because he'd been like in Planet, he'd been a monkey in a Tarzan <laughs> film. And he sort of really, he just, he'd had no ambition. He just sort of, anyway, we got, I got in. But I, I had a lot of people helping. And obviously, and also the music did the work. With the music, you either directed the action in support of it, or you directed the action to undercut it like you know how Tarantino puts an ear being cut off under jolly music you know yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. it's basically just choices like that so you know that's how it got there and I mean I I do I feel I was given more credit than I deserve uh, not financially I was on I wasn't on a massive split but because I was a bit better known even then than Richard mm. Thomas it tended to attach itself to me and also to be fair a lot of the ideas in it that ended up getting us into trouble that meant it was essentially closed down and we were all bankrupt were mm. things that I brought to it. So <laughs> well done to me. But um, it's it's opening in New York um, in, in about two weeks. What, Jerry Springer? Yeah, I didn't know. Do you know how I found out? What? Okay, well, when I let... Well, I had to get away from my major label, Avalon, in the early 90s, in the early noughties. Yeah. So I waited until they'd paid me anything they owed me. And then I didn't sign a new contract and then I just went but I knew they would try and hold me to them by saying well we've got the rights to this and we've got the rights to that and they'd produced the Joe Springer the opera as a live thing yeah so I sent them a, a letter saying I relinquish all rights to it right because I knew I I had to get out yeah right? yeah uh, because I had to try and make what I was doing economically viable yeah and also the bigger they got, the more corporate. I mean, they're like the sort of Uber of comedy now. And like, yeah. it would be difficult to do left-wing liberal stuff being managed by a company yeah, like yeah. that. So I had to get out. So I wasn't really in the loop about what was happening to it. Um, and also Richard Thomas had told me something was going on. He said, do you want to be involved? And I went, well, not really, because I'm in this massive tour. And if I get involved, it, it, it ended so badly first time around. It, it does give me the shakes a bit. Still. But, yeah, but then I went to see... Even going to the theatre where it was on in the West End is a bit like... I went to see a show there with the kids and it was it was a bit weird being in there, you know. Was but, it because of the threats that you got and stuff like that? Well, yeah, and, and also there was business stuff about it that was weird and like... And you went to court and stuff. You know, yeah. But anyway, the... Uh, yeah, I, was, I went to see Richard Dawson, you know. the th- Yeah. Yeah, at the, in a church in Hackney in um, November, December last year. No, no, it was about September. and Or in the summer. And Izzy Sooty was there, the comedian from Peep Show. And she went, oh, your congratulations on the opera being on in New York. And I went, oh, is it? I, th- I, hadn't, I, thought, I thought something was happening to it. Then I went and Googled it, and it was, and there was a website with me on it and everything. But I don't know if I'll... I mean, I assume I'll get paid for it at some point, but, it's, but if it, it just depends whether it finds its way through Avalon back to me. I don't know. But in, the, it's in a way... It's, been re- it's, it's, come back, it's taken this long to come come back because I was watching I watched it on Saturday oh yeah on DVD yeah. a while ago yeah and I was like this is so good like this is so good I can't believe that 
okay, the reason it stops is because of all the complaints and that kind of yeah. stuff. But it's a shame that it hasn't come back. So I'm surprised it's taken yeah. this long well, to come you know, back. I mean, look, he's done it. He's done it. <coughs> he's over there doing it, right? The, the funny thing is, on Broadway, right, it's going to have proper. We, it's going to have proper Broadway type music theatre people doing, it, which actually might make it funnier. And it's being directed by a guy who directed Jury in Town, which was a big Broadway hit. So in a way, it's sort of like you know when Will Oldham from Palace Brothers. Instead of being like indie alternative country, he made one album with proper Nashville session musicians. Right. They mm-hmm. sounded really good, actually. Right, you okay. sort of think, you know what? He sort of is that. So why not? So I kind of think if he do it, do it with the actual people that would do it in a parallel world if it was real, <laughs> and uh, you, see what happens. You, you know? mentioned if those all those complaints hadn't happened, you could have ended up being that as a kind of that could have been a career for yeah, you. Yeah. Well, um, right. And when I watched it the other day, there was a great line because I was thinking, oh, I wonder if she gets like offers to do the same still. Um, and then there was a line in it, Jerry Springer said, which was, uh, I'm guessing you wrote this line. I don't want to serve in hell at this point in my career. That would be a sideways move. Yeah. And I was like. Would you go back to that now, or would you? Is no, that... I can't remember who wrote that line. To be okay. honest, I mean, it's I, <coughs> I, what in, in terms of who wrote it? I mean, lots of the the cross talk in the first half is is from R- Richard Thomas, and it's a very, it's a sort of uh, like a cabaret sensibility, which we sort of have. the second half where it gets where all the stuff in the first half that's dialogue, or um, in the second half where it's all these sort of philosophical arguments against each other, what I would do would be assemble huge blocks of text mm. and then um, get him to remove which bits he wanted to tell, gotcha. and then we'd stitch it all together. The only There's only a couple of songs in it we actually sat around and wrote together, and one of them's the sort of Tom Waits pastiche, which is It Ain't Easy Being Me That God Sings. Yeah. And um, that's weirdly the most... It's the most through-sung musical moment. The rest of them, they're like quite like... John Zorn or Zappa or something, they're all kind of cut up. Yeah. Like, they're like songs cut to pieces and then stitched together in the wrong order. So even though its tonality is quite conventional, the structure of it is quite avant-garde, weirdly. It's certainly the weirdest thing that's ever been a West End yeah, yeah, yeah. music. But that line about sideways move, look, the thing, what all I wanted, after being buffeted, I mean, the Jerry Spring the Opera experience made me what I am, for, for people that can't remember or never heard of it, you know, it was it was thought of as it was going to be the defining musical of its generation, and critically it was, mm. but it couldn't quite. Tra- the only the, the way those things make money, and that's the awful thing about it, is they have to become franchises. You know, then there's like eight versions of them on all going over. Right, okay. Yeah, and they then they, that means they have to operate to a grid, right? Each one has to be able to be replicable, right? Right. Even to the point where they'll cast similar sized people, so the costumes. Have a uniform, you know, uniformity. Brilliant. Yeah, but Springer was resistant to becoming a grid-like production because of our backgrounds in comedy mm. meant that we built in loads of room for improvisation and change, and for the for the chorus to interpret what they wanted to do, and also because there were proper, genuine laughs in it, not theatre laughs, <laughs> actual proper, yeah. uncontrollable laughs. Everyone on stage, you couldn't do it to a click track; they had to feel the timing of it and different nights like they are for stand-ups were different yeah. so it, and the the conductor had to do something that no one in music theatre ever has to do because it's all so unfunny and shit is they had to actually <laughs> learn to listen to the room wow. you, know, you know so it was difficult to grid it out because it was and the other reason you couldn't do it anywhere is because people in other countries would look at what happened to the tour in Britain and think well it's not viable and the tour in Britain wasn't viable because a far right Christian group picketed it and told the theatres that they would use the forthcoming incitement to religious hatred bill to close them down and prosecute them if they put it on stage. Mm. Now, as it happened, that bill, the incitement to religious hatred bill, was pending. It lost by one vote. Oh. And it didn't go through, but it was too late. And then the blasphemy law was subsequently removed from the statutes in the House of Lords in a debate that was triggered by what happened to really? us. Really? Because interesting of the, wow. thing, yeah. And it was very funny reading the, reading the um, transcripts of it, which you can still find online, because there are people in the Lords going, obviously this show is puerile rubbish of the first water, and all of those involved in it should be ashamed. But, my noble Lords, I'm afraid there is no grounds to prosecute. <laughs> it was really weird, like they were sort of, you were going, you're sort of punching the air and going, and then you're going, oh, hang on a minute. That's <laughs> perfect for the poster. <laughs> I know, but, so you couldn't, so what happened, I'd look at it and go, well, it, it couldn't do it, you know, so it had no life. Plus, the Daily Mail just kept making up lies about it. And in the end, we won a legal case against them. Did you? But Yeah, we didn't get money for it, but they had to pay costs. But the, what they did was they kept saying that people weren't going to it, and they were. 
Right. But that meant that people didn't want to book it because they thought it wasn't... It'd be empty. Yeah. So, um, and then, if, you know, that was... That was uh, I do sometimes remind them of that subtly, the Daily Mail, when they're making up stuff about me now, mm. which they do about every six months. I'll, I'll write a little blog about it or something online and put... Um, it's a bit like that other time when I lost when I won that case against them, and then you find that the article sort of disappears or something. Really? Yeah, it's quite it does. Interesting. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you famously don't use Twitter, and I wondered if subconsciously that was a result of you experience what it's like to be someone on a profile um, and being on the receiving end yeah. of streams of baseless abuse oh. due, due to the Jerry Springer fallout. Is yeah. that linked? Do you think? Partly. I mean, that, that was bad enough then before Twitter. Yeah. You know, but you wouldn't want to have a. You don't. We wouldn't want to provide a. A, a target for them where they could just send everything but I do look at Twitter and I actually find it very useful and certainly in between the first and second or the second and third series there was a point doing Comedy Vehicle on telly where the direction of the programme and the nature of the character was shaped very specifically by me looking at tens of thousands of words of abuse online mm. and seeing what those people hated and thinking well it needs to be more like that because that's what it's supposed to be yeah. and they've sort of misunderstood so it it kind of forced my hand. The other reason I don't do it is because, well, first of all, when I left big management, Avalon, I was worried about how, what was I going to do? Then I, MySpace was happening, <laughs> right? And of course, back then, musicians were going mad about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. MySpace, what? It's like, it's like you talk about a steam engine now, isn't it? Yeah, I, but it was, it was a big thing. Yeah, yeah but I thought if I get, if I get like. 5,000 people on MySpace yeah. and they come to shows if I can get 100 people in Derby mm. and I've not had advertising or a promoter I've done it through MySpace then mm. I'm alright on it that's a living and it, yeah. and I, so I used MySpace but I didn't cross over and I also had to do, do something on MySpace because there was some tending to be me on MySpace really? yeah which was creating weird problems where people were sending them information and oh, you know um, and I'm um, Actually, it was a funny thing where I was looking at the false me on MySpace. I was, and he, I was trying to get him to stop being me, so I MySpaced him. And he went, why are you pretending to be me? It was really weird. And he wouldn't do it. Then one day I saw an Eliza Carthy, the folk singer, had got in touch with him. And the, fo the folk singer had said to him, I really like your, your stuff. It would be great to meet you or something. And then the Stuart Lee said to the Eliza Carthy, yeah, likewise. But I knew Eliza Carthy, and I've been working with her, so I knew that was a false Eliza Carthy as well. Oh, I know, it'd be bizarre, isn't it? So weird, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so I did MySpace, and that sort of got it all moving. But then the problem now with pe people say, if I had Twitter, I could, you know, weaponize it, monetize it. But I'm not the same as the comedy version of me, right? And I would have to decide which character you're which character to do it. Sometimes the fact that I exist independently of that character creates problems. I got, I got asked by Radio 4, this artist, Rose Wiley, she's in her 80s and she likes my comedy. And I she said, to it. Yeah, you went would have done an interview. Yeah. I loved it. I love meeting her and I love her work anyway. But Gillian Reynolds, the um, critic, radio critic of The Telegraph, which is a terrible paper anyway, but she went, <laughs> she went, Stuart Lee's supposed to be this iconoclastic figure and yet he went there and she made him act like a pussycat and he wasn't rude to her. I thought, what the fuck was it? Like, what did they think I was going to do? Yeah. You know, I was mad. Like, I went as me to meet a nice old woman. Yeah. Crazy. But, um, so it would be complicated, you know. And also, I think the character of Stuart Lee on stage, he wouldn't do Twitter, would he? No. You'd think it was for idiots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So it, you, yeah. Can't, you can't do it, you know. Did that whole um, the fallout of Jerry Springer and the response that you got, did that affect you either consciously or subconsciously in regards to your future output? I mean, you've done kind of delicate subjects since then, but immediately afterwards, when you're writing, were you thinking... No, what I thought was, because to me, Jerry Springer the Opera wasn't offensive, right? To me, I thought we were going to get done for being politically correct snowflakes, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it, I thought it was so even-handed, yeah. and I thought the soul of it was about don't judge the, the very people that everyone does jokes about, chavs and prostitutes, yeah. and you know, don't judge them, right? They're they're the same as the heroes of classical mythology. They've got the same, they're the same as your saints. They're the same as your gods. They've mm. got the same passions and feelings and weaknesses and strengths. That to me was what it was about. Yeah, and I can't and you would have to willfully misinterpret it 
to make it into what they said it was. But of course, a lot of the people that said what it was hadn't seen it anyway, right? Yeah. So, but but I realised it was justifiable. That was the thing is, when you did come up against people that hated it, it was justifiable. In Aberdeen, I had to cross a picket line to get to a press conference to talk about it at the theatre. And all the protesters outside were going, let us in, let us in. So I went, all right. So I let them into the press conference and said they could ask questions and they could have biscuits, right? <laughs> and they were like, couldn't believe it. They were, we can have biscuits. I was going, yeah. They'd come and get a biscuit and like, run off. Right? They'd... Anyway, one of them asked me some question about it and I answered it at length about what we're trying to do. Yeah. And he went, oh, it's all just words with you, isn't it? Words, words, <laughs> words. So they didn't want to know anyway. But, what, but I could explain what we had wanted to do with it, right? So two things I took away from it were one, if you can do the most critically acclaimed musical of the 21st century, have it in the West End and the National Theatre, and it goes on telly, and you still come out of it with nothing, mm. right? Then there's not much point trying to do a big thing, right? So the one thing I did was I tried to, I left the rock and roll management, stripped everything back down to zero, didn't have any management for a bit, and started trying to do like little gigs where, you know, because like 100 people, 10 quid above a pub yeah. after the promoter. I'd made more than I did out of 500 people being in the theatre in the West End at mm. 50 quid a ticket. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Because it was the overheads. Was like... Then the other thing I think is you can do really controversial stuff, but you've got to, you've got to A, know why you're doing it, which I don't think someone like Frankie Boyle always knew. Mm. And you've got to also think a little bit about where it is and who's going to see it. And so what I have tried to do quite consciously since then is I put bad reviews on posters, yeah. you know, and I I don't really... It's become a thing now, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't force my stuff on people. No. And I don't put it in the face. And if you found me to be offended by me, you've probably gone out of your way to do yeah. so, to be honest, you know. Um, so it did change that. And it, it also made... The Springer thing also made me realise that what you were doing had to be worth it because it could be stopped at any minute and you could be bankrupted. So you had to sort of, and you could be threatened with prison. So you had to think, what what's it really about? And actually it was like a, it was a big thing personally as well. I think people in my life suffered a little bit that I, I sort of just burned, I, I did like a, you know, sort of scorched earth policy to everything behind me and Mm. move forwards and start it again and um, uh, so it was an amazing thing to be part of but it was it was sort of like you were destroyed by it and then had to start again thanks for sharing that it's, it's <laughs> such an interesting like insight yeah yeah it's, it's, um, it's a great show and um, I'm kind of glad it's back but I'm kind of hope that you kind of see well you know what I'd love so to like, do is I, I'd like to go, go there, to then, New yeah. York and see it and for no one to know I was in, yeah. and to just see it as a punter. But I always had a problem, there was a, a finale put on it at the request of the producer. I wanted it, we wanted it to end, where Jerry Springer is on the floor dying, he's being cradled by the bouncer. It was a very self-conscious attempt to um, mimic the shape of the Pieta uh, by Michelangelo, right. where Mary's cradling Christ in, um, <laughs> okay. in uh, yeah. the Vatican, yeah. right? And uh, there was this very holy musical round with a choir of all the guests singing, and this light coming down, and that was supposed to be the end, and it ended on this kind of diminished seventh, you know, that kind of clever musical thing where a thing just goes not quite where yeah. you expect it to go, you know. And that was supposed to be the end, and I, and I wanted people to be left with that image, and it was always like that, right up to the last minute, until it finally was going to go to the National Theatre, when it came out of Fringe Theatre, and we were told we needed a West End finale, and then the, con the co conductor, Martin Lowe and Richard, and the producers kind of cooked up this thing where there were loads of staircases and everyone was dancing all around them. Yeah. And it, it put it back to pastiche, right, which it wasn't supposed to be. To me, it was a thing in its own right. It didn't only exist in terms of being a parody of musical theatre. It was supposed to be a thing. And I, I, went, I, I, tried, I fought it every step of the way, but I couldn't win that battle. So what I used to do was leave before the end. I never wanted to see that mm. finale. I used to go so that I had the end that I wanted, right? And... Um, so what I'd have to do in New York is get out before the they still got it. <laughs> the weird thing was they insisted on this big finish, and of course it it put a massive cost on it, and it also went to loads of places you couldn't do it because you had to have this this um, Busby Berkeley staircase thing, right? Happening, right you know, um, yeah. well, like Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire yeah. kind of thing, and so it actually sort of fucked it in loads of ways. But I'd, 
I'd love to I'd love to see it and have no baggage to do with it and, and no and not even to know whether I was going to be paid and because when people come to it clean they love it you know and I, I my I met my wife around the time that all the shit was really hitting the fan with it and uh then she she came to see it in Plymouth I remember it which is one of the places that it did manage to tour to and she said what's wrong with people it's like really great mm. I, I sort of forgot it is really it's great. brilliant you know it's, like, it's brilliant. yeah yeah um so some of the artists that you're kind of interested in that I actually didn't know too much about right checked out some of their albums over the weekend so I'd be interested to chat to you about them Dick um is it Dick Gokken? Dick Gokken, yeah, Gokken. Scottish, yeah, yeah, Scottish. yeah, yeah. I listened to Handful of Look. That's great. What a beautiful it? album, yeah. yeah. Um, Song for Ireland was a beautiful song yeah. there, and, and both sides of the tweet. Um, tell us about that particular album. Why is that something that you particularly like? Well, again, it's at a different time. It's weird. Like, how did you find out about music in the seventies? You know, and then the early and the eighties. You you listened to John Peel, or someone told you about things. Nothing was apart from Peel. Nothing was on the radio, yeah. really. You know, there wasn't the internet. There was. There wasn't Spotify, there wasn't mm. iTunes. And I remember, and, but you had a library, Solihull Library had a folk section. Oh. And I used to try and get things from the library that I didn't know what they were. And some of the folk albums, particularly the ones on Topic Records, had really sort of striking covers of the sort of thing that you would now call acid folk imagery or folk horror. They were stark. And that, the first one I got, I think, was a June Table one where it was just her face in this dark she's got this judgmental haughty expression on which is really unlike pop music it's like your shit <laughs> and the dick gockham one fuck the cover of the album yeah i know yeah. he's in like some baggy jeans with a jumper on and he's standing in the middle of this field, field. of corn yeah. somewhere in scotland with like some heavy industry in the distance with his arms folded <laughs> just looking at you like you're a piece of shit you know and like i thought wow and it, it seemed like really like hard in a way that like punk some punk and rock images but like childishly of like someone's going nah, 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 flicking their V's at <laughs> yeah, you yeah I got it yeah no <laughs> in front of a power station of yeah, course it's a superb yeah. album and yeah. um so it was just luck really and then it was luck and then you'd, you'd follow these little wormholes down what was available to you and I couldn't really know you couldn't really find out what other records he'd made or anything mm, there was no yeah. you could check I mean, stuff was off the grid that was an it was an exciting thing about then and it is wonderful now to be able to get all this stuff that you'd only ever dreamed of. Mm. But on the other hand, I mean, that, that record, had a, like, it was like owning a magical artifact when you finally found it, mm. you know, so. Yeah. And Nick Jones, Penguin Eggs. Yeah, same, really same. I, you know what? I'll tell you where I heard that. And again, it speaks of a different time. About 1982, I was in the Virgin Records in Birmingham. And I used noticed that if a certain guy was behind the counter, I would often like the music that was playing. Mm. Because back then, the music wasn't being piped in from head office. It's been chosen by the person. It's chosen. Oh, and, right. and people in regional record shops, chain stores, were allowed to stock different things in different parts of the country because they had an awareness of regional tastes. Right, right. But now it's all standard. Anyway, this guy was called Martin, I think, and he, a number of records he played in there that I liked over the years were Game Theory, who were a kind of clever sub REM wordy power pop group um, the June Bride who one of the early sort of post-punk shambly smithsy type groups I remember buying those because they were playing in the shop and then this Penguin Eggs by Nick Jones which was a folk album but amazing sort of stark quality to it brilliant voice it's one of the great folk albums Penguin Eggs that guy Martin weirdly turned out he was in a band called uh, The Great Outdoors who were like a Birmingham REM copying type group and then he ended up running a Again, before the internet, he ran a mail order company for all the kind of bands that became what you call alt country mm. when you couldn't find them in shops. Or he now works in the box office at the Symphony Hall in Birmingham. Whenever I go to perform there, I always say hello to him and thank him for the musical education that a guy in a record shop could give you in those days. Mm. You know, you'd pick it up, you'd pick stuff up. Or there were people would say, "Oh, do you like that? Listen to this." I, you know, I went into I went into FOP the other day trying to find the box set that's come out of Who's Could Do and the bloke behind the counter had never heard of them and I did think that was a bit of an oversight probably for someone <laughs> working in a record shop did you um, there's a couple of tunes off that Nick Jones album and I was like reminds me of Bellahead did you ever hear any Bellahead yeah stuff? I do like Bellahead yeah because well, I saw Al Murray at one of his, their gigs and he was absolutely loving them oh right, like, right. Yeah, well, yeah. They, they probably would have learned that yeah. from him you know I mean when I, when I was very lucky about seven years ago I got asked to programme a weekend at the Royal Festival Hall 
Oh, nice. uh, like a mini meltdown because I was doing a big stand-up show there and Nick Jones who hadn't played for 30 years he had a really bad car accident mm. and he lost he couldn't play and he'd lost his um he couldn't remember things either oh, okay. but his son was sort of helping him out and kind of heard he was kind of he'd done one gig at the Sydney Folk Festival so he did a night there mm. and uh, I saw about the back half of it and it was really good he got he got I mean, massive outpouring of goodwill to him from all these um, other folk singers, yeah. So, you know, he did he did fake plastic trees by radio. Did he? Yeah, I mean, it's as if it were a folk ballad. I'd love and it to hear just, that. Well, as you can find it on YouTube, floating wow. about. And it just um, settled beautifully, you know. So a band that you've done a hundred interviews about uh, the fall, yeah. And I know I think the first gig you ever went to, or one of the first gigs you went to, was to see them, and you got spiked for their LSD. Is that? Yeah, right? I think so. In retrospect, <laughs> when I was at the time. And now I look back on it, um, they're a band I've actually never seen live, and I'm, I'm right. going to go and see them. Um, so you've obviously done a lot of interviews about them, but for listeners, or, I mean, we have listeners all over the world, and yeah. if those who might not know them, what is it that they're missing out on? Well, there's lots of great things about the fall. One is that the the um, the singer and the main person, Marky e. Smith, appears not to be able to sing. But if you try to do what he does, you can't do it. It's a, an engineer who'd worked on one of their records said it's a bit like Miles Davis's trumpet playing. You can't really load anything against it. And when the vocal comes in, it changes the, the colour of everything around it. Yeah. You know, so what? The probably the most famous Miles M- Miles Davis track. It's sort of do 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 do. It bops along that for a bit, and then his trumpet comes in. It just goes. Just one note, yeah. and everything goes bang off. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. all changed, and that's what Mark Smith's voice is like. It's bizarre. Yeah. It's utterly distinctive. It's like a sort of clever dog that can speak, barking at you. Yeah. And uh, and he, but he's and he he went through a phase where he was known for writing very complex, clever lyrics. Now he's incoherent. He just sounds like it's growling. He's having fun with the actual tonality of what his throat can do. That isn't that's sort of non-musical. It's brilliant. The timing of it's brilliant. I think it's really funny. Yeah in a way that people often miss. They tend to think he's mad, but actually it seems to me he's having an elaborate joke at the expense of the world. A few years ago they got to play Glastonbury again, and Twitter was alive with the fact that there was appears to be a piss stain on his trousers. I think he thought, what would be the funniest thing I could do? Be to go on national television (laughs) with a piss stain on my trousers. Whereas Chris Martin went on that uh, benefit (laughs) show with a piss stain on his trousers and clearly wasn't aware of it at Manchester Arena. You know, so that's it. there's been a lot of musicians in it, which people seem to think is funny, but actually it's been going like 40 odd years now, so there's gonna be a lot of uh, heft. And uh, the, the, the sound is still, to this day, built on what he obviously liked as a child in the immediate pre-punk era, which was all the bands of the early 70s and mid 70s and late 60s that we've sort of tend to forget existed because we tend to think of it as glam rock and progressive rock, but it's can and the Stooges yeah. and um, garage punk and uh, old dub reggae, all those kind of things are mixed up in there. It's basically what formed the sensibilities of that generation, in- infinitely recombined. Um, the the As a fan, I've learned a lot from them in that the the, the set list for different nights can be essentially the same, but the mood will totally alter it. How? Well, I just don't know. It's just something about, you say, do we go on in character? I think sometimes either consciously or through the use of wrong amounts of alcohol, he kind of can go in and just be a different person mm. and that changes the whole thing. When they've got little residencies places, if I'm not working, I'll go all four nights. The last one I went to three or four nights in a row about a year and a half ago in a Highbury garage. Mm. And some nights the same song would be 20 minutes and then four the next oh, night, right, so just depending on yeah. whether it kind of caught fire. Um, I think he's done a, a good thing as well, which I probably have assimilated, which is that by making himself not clubbable, he's removed himself from the, the social club of rock through being rude, behaving badly, and by being consistently good, and by work turning a new thing around every year. I mean... Then you're not in the you're not in competition. Yeah. You're sort of your own thing, and like you can hate the fall, you can not like it. You can say it makes you feel sick to listen to, but on its own terms, it's entirely succeeded. So that kind of is like what I try to think is, you can't really give me a bad review because I, I always do what I've tried to do, and also if it does go badly, then that's what would happen to that character anyway. Of mm. course, it would go badly because. 
Yeah. He's he's sort of got a gene towards self sabotage. So it's sort of it's kind of they create this protective bubble around them. I'm really grateful as well because like they've created they've had sort of thirty five years of adventures going mm. to see them, and I will when he finally doesn't do it anymore. I don't know what it'll take to stop him. He did the last few dates in a wheelchair with a bloated face as a result of some uh, you know dr- drug reaction to really? medication he'd been yeah. prescribed. When he it still finally ended it, still yeah. When it finally isn't happening, it will be it will be for a, a normal person like if Manchester United were suddenly to just not exist anymore. Mm. It's like a a thing that you've got that you can hang on to in your life, and it's always so exciting. To think what's he going to come up with next? And the last album. I thought it was still like one of the, the things in it that made me laugh out loud with the audacity of them, like, and the kids, the kids thought it was so funny and they didn't really <laughs> understand that it was even music. <laughs> they thought it was just a thing and they really loved it. There's a great story about it when um, it's really hard to get on the bill for Jules Holland, late with Jules Holland, and they were asked to go on late with Jules Holland, um, and he agreed to do it. On, but it was written into the contract that <laughs> Jules Holland wouldn't play piano on this. <laughs> he was not allowed to play piano. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. know well, this is the Jules thing, Holland. right? It's a really funny thing to do, and you kind of, I mean, you, right? Some, t- some, right? Sometimes I'll go and see them, and I think, it's like, is he really like slagging me off or? And then people go, have you heard this? And the gig I was out and there's like, words have been changed to say that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know really? him, right? It's like, <laughs> I thought, like, the stuff about me, like, slagging me off. Really? And, and yeah, I think it's really funny. It's like, um, uh, I, I don't mind at all. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I would have had a very different life without them. Because also, in the post-punk era, you know, a lot of bands would name drop like existentialist writers or weird art or mm. in the lyrics and then you'd go and check it out but it did mean they probably read them that means they've probably looked at the Wikipedia entry but mm. you know it got me to read Camus and Arthur Macken and things that I really like because they were bleeding through those those words and also the things that influenced them which are now readily available like Can or The Velvet Underground um, they were hard to find those records in those days and you know, it, it was like you've been given a reading list almost, right. and you have to go and follow it up. You know, what's the most important piece of music memorabilia you own? I'm not actually allowed to say because I shouldn't have it. <gasps> yeah, Damn. and and um, okay, it's probably yeah. Okay, what's your second most important? Well, <laughs> I've got I've got some I've got some nice things. I've got uh, I've got uh, well. I've got a drumstick that I caught from an early fall gig that was thrown into the... I've got, uh, I've got a, a very rare a poster that I didn't realise was as valuable as it is. I, I, there's a, a group that I got into as a, as a teenager. Andy Kershaw played one of their tracks once about 1984, the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. They were a sort of forgotten psychedelic group that I really loved. And I, I've been on the road for 20 years you know, before the internet, you might be trawling second-hand shots for stuff, and I gradually managed to find all their records. That was the most expensive record I've ever bought, actually, in at the time, in the mid-90s. I bought a solo album by the guy from that for 50 quid, and uh, then someone was writing an article about him for a magazine, a, 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 a rich banker who is a psychedelic collector, mm-hmm. was writing them for a collector's magazine. He got in touch with me to ask me some questions about something, and I... I don't think I even particularly helped him out. I don't know why, but then he he sent me this poster in the in the post of a a poster for them from the time for the West Coast War Experimental Band, and I thought, oh, that's nice. Framed it and put it up, and then it turned up in Record Collector that there was only a, a few of them, and that it was worth not thousands, but yeah. a lot, you know. And I I had no idea, and I, it was done by the artist who went on to do the Ernie Ball strings. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Fr- yeah. yeah and. Um, so I got in touch with this guy and I went, you can't, I can't believe you give me this. I didn't. He said, well, what have you done with it? I went, well, I've, I put it, I really like it. I'd frame it. The thing is, I put it up before I knew what it was worth. So I was, I was yeah. in the clear. I said, you got, you can have it back. And he's going, no, I think he'd got a few of them, you know, but that is a great thing to have. But then there's other little things like things you got signed or, or, you know, I've got some, got, or, or, or records that you used to buy in the old record and tape exchange and suddenly you'd find 
that they were the artist's copy with a letter inside them or mm. whatever, stuff like that, you know. Um, you had a Radio 1 show for a while, is that right? Richard well, in, in the, it's hard to imagine now, but in the, between about 90 and 96, 97, Radio 1 had spoken word strand between about 9 and 10 or 10 and 11 at night. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things they did was gave comedians radio shows where you had to play some music and then you'd do little items and things. And um, Could you choose the music? or were you, is Well, it other playlist? people didn't, but I was, I was very adamant that I wasn't going to do it unless we could. And actually it worked wow. quite well because the way the dynamic worked was Rich Herring, who I did the double act with at the time. I, I, all through the 90s, I did you know 200-odd club gigs a year of stand-up as me, and I did Edinburgh shows as me. But the thing I was best known for, and the things I took the most time, was doing the double yeah. act. And we did two... We did we did four teleseries of that, actually. Yeah. But again, it was... Richard, not Judy. Yeah, yeah. Richard. But anyway, with the, and they came out of the radio shows party. And Rich was very... Rich was very suited to that sort of zoo radio format. Mm. He's a big personality... Um, and the, the way dynamic work was, I'd, it was I'd sort of chosen the music, and he could sort of complain about how it was all stupid and not <laughs> right. the music, and so it worked quite well. But I used to, I, used to, I mean, funnily enough, you meet people years later who say the first place they heard a particular thing was um, was uh, on that on that show, and then one of them being um, one of the, the the drummer from no, the, one of the blokes from Franz Ferdinand said it's where he heard Mission of Burma and Guided by Voices and all these American sort of hardcore post-punk bands that formed his sensibility on some level so it was quite funny but I don't claim to have formed Frame Franz Ferdinand <laughs> yeah, so I'm not okay. like the, the fifth Franz Ferdinand <laughs> member George Mine yeah, um, yeah um, okay we'll begin to wrap up a couple of last questions um, what ambitions do you still have left? well uh, really uh, they're quite I mean really to try and find a way of of touring like a year on a year off you know and um to try to meet the demand without having to do so many dates, but without having to go into unworkable rooms. And also to, to try and keep this going for sort of 15 years. But I need to work out some way of it not killing me because the longer I tour, the more out of shape I get. Just from not going to sleep, partly, from the... The, the problem of being awake after a gig, what do you do? Do you, do you drink? Do you go to sleep? Do you, it's just... You, you still know. got that adrenaline? Do you get that adrenaline after each show? Or is it afterwards, yeah. yeah. Not before, but afterwards. And then... Because you meet a lot of people after. Yeah, well, I always sell stuff. But, yeah. I, but that's partly like a decompression chamber, you know. And also, I think it's... If you do an hour of like signing and stuff and selling your stuff, first of all, the DVD bloke continues to invest in you because eventually you will sell enough to cover the costs of yeah. making it. Also, it's funny, I think, to be horrible and mad on stage for two and a half hours <laughs> and then to just be really yeah. polite to people. It amuses me no end. Yeah. You know? and, and then, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm 50 this year and I I think my ki my son particularly suffered a bit the last year or so by me not being around with homework and stuff like that. And uh, also... There's no two ways about it. I mean, it takes years off your life. Um, I'm in a really good groove now, where I've got the I've got the the touring unit down to me and my tour manager James Hingley, who also texts it and helps me sell the merch and drives, and is just perfect because he used to be in bands 20 years ago. So he's really good with all the technical staff. They can't get one past him because he knows how it works, and he's really easy company. And actually, uh, the, that that is quite an important part of it. Just being able to be with someone and. Um, so really only that I've got no ambitions I mean if I if I said I've got a mad ambition it would be that I would like to try and make a western in the style of 60s Italian westerns that is sort of about musical variety acts in the west right and I've got I, I keep having ideas about it but you know when I was talking earlier and I said that for me Jerry Springer, the opera wasn't a parody of musicals and it, it was a thing in its own right that used the genre and it annoyed me that they tried to pull it back towards that. What I need to do with the Western is find out a way that it, it is of that rather than assimilating it and commenting on it. Even Tarantino's Westerns, to me, they're not honest. They're sort of about quotations, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm even much as I like them. They're, so that, that's the only thing, but I mean, it's a, other than that, the stuff I'll do. I'll probably do some more things with Capri Battery. I'll probably uh, do 
uh, at, at some point I might do something with, me and Alan Moore talked about trying to write a sitcom nice I've, 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 I, I think I'd, I'd like to do something again with Andrew Cotting the filmmaker who used me a little bit in one of his films there's all sorts of things floating about um, I, the, the, the Nightingales this old Birmingham post-punk band that I like sort of things nearly keep sort of coming together about making some sort of film about them or something mm. but it is difficult because stuff moves so slowly in telly or film whereas a stand-up show you write it you work it out you do it I'm used to being able to get things going mm. fast and you know and there's an interesting piece in uh, your current show content provider where you kind of break down um, the costs of making a DVD and what you get out of it and that was the moment I was there last week and I was like that aligns so closely to some of the stuff in the music industry yeah. and a question we normally ask at the end of the uh, podcast is what fears do you have for the music industry um, and how might they be addressed so just to tailor that a little bit what fears do you have for artists or creative people in the digital age and how might those fears be addressed well um, I think it's an even bigger problem than that right I in the early part of this century I started moaning all the time about how the Edinburgh Fringe wasn't what it used to be, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, that the comedy aspect of it was increasingly controlled by two or three major companies who ran their own promotions wing, who ran their own management wing, who ran their own TV production wing, and all these wings would feed work to each other, and the only people that weren't getting paid were the acts. And I realised I was part of the problem, which is why I left those sorts of companies. I also realised that those companies could sort of act as gatekeepers, feeding journalists and by association media interest towards their acts and they would do that with the compliance of three or four big venues and that the whole thing was increasingly stitched up and but then I realise now that while I was looking at that and moaning about that that's what Uber were doing that's mm -hmm. what Amazon were doing that's what Apple are doing that's what they all do if everyone tries to use sort of disruptive techniques yeah to basically end up owning everything so there's no competition. Mm. So that you own the talent and you also own the means by which that talent is distributed, mm. right? Um, Jared Kobeck in his novel um, that's just come out the year before last, I Hate the Internet, says that he uses um, a, an example of 60s comic book creators um, as to what's happened to all of us. We all think it's terrible, don't we, that the blokes that created Superman didn't own it and that um, Jack Kirby, who created all the Marvel characters, didn't own them because they were work for hire for the company. And the character you created on their watch belonged to them. And it was at their discretion as to whether you got paid for it or not. And it was only by publicly shaming those companies when those characters became massive film franchises that the people that actually invented them saw anything. Jarrett Kobeck, the novelist, points out that we are now all that. We upload our content all the time mm. to YouTube and Facebook and all these places where it is monetized by them and used to drive traffic through their websites. Mm. So, and now we're made to think that's normal. People think it's great that there's a platform for their stuff to be seen, and yet they're not, the, the, the endless point, the point at which they're reimbursed for their work in any real terms is endlessly moved further and further into the distance, yeah. you know. And um, now musicians are supposed to be, when I was young, and it was true in comedy as well, we were told it didn't matter that we were touring at a loss. Musicians were told it didn't matter they were touring at a loss because it was about promoting the product yeah. or about raising your profile for other opportunities. Suddenly the product can't be monetized. Mm. And now musicians are told that the product acts as a kind of shop window to encourage people to go and see them on yes, tour, okay. which suddenly is profitable. Because at some point the people that own them need to see some money from them. Yeah. So they're now saying, oh, like, it's all about the life, right? They've got to get something out of them. So I don't know what the answer is. I think that, um, I think that things are moving further away from what I understood. I know that loads of people say that... Um, you can use YouTube and things like that to become a kind of, kind of personality and drive your the, your brand forward. But that's okay if you are a sort of a personality person. I can't see that how that would work for most of the artists I liked because mm. they're not those sort of people. They're incommunicative or they didn't get into it to be a personality. What it seems to favour that culture is vacuous YouTubers who have nothing, they've got no thing that they've made. They've just got the ability to fill space with nothing. Yeah. And then they become sort of a monetizable brand. And uh, so I really don't know what the answer is. I mean, I mean, I think it's great that 
you can get something up on Bandcamp and it can just be out there immediately. But, I mean, when I read that Apple of buying Shazam, I think, right, that's that's not good, is it? That's another... Because for a while, that app worked, worked for us, didn't it? Because mm. you'd think, what's that music? It's great. And your mate would hold up his phone and he'd yeah. go, it's uh, Strychnine by the Sonics. They're from 1965. Really? I'm going to buy that. Then they might get some money from it. Now, Shazam is only going to recognise you, isn't it? If you're on Apple's music library. Right, right. right? So, it, again, it's... Oh, so is that... Of course that's right? what's going to happen. Yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. <laughs> Sh- a- a- Apple is not going to drive traffic no, 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 yeah. towards something it can't monetize, is it? Yeah, yeah, so everything yeah. that seems like innovation, you suddenly realise is actually mm. um, about narrowing the, the, the narrowing things, you know? Mm. And, and I... And the, 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 the people that worked this out in comedy actually sort of did it ahead of the music business people creating these. There was a point where Avalon, the rock and roll management company I was with, about 18 months ago, two years ago, was sort of offering magnanimously to take BBC Three off the BBC's hands and keep it not as an internet station, but as a digital as a digital yeah. channel. Clearly, so they could put all their own things on it, right? Yeah. Then they've got, they like own the the, 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 the the way that the information's disseminated as well as owning all the people that make it. I mean, luckily it didn't happen, but it would have been incredibly bad for, for, for comedy in Britain uh, because people would have had no choice but to go with them then. That's the problem, is in, in, a, in our day, it was easier to make a moral stand about things because there were always other choices. Yeah. Whereas now, for lots of artists, if you're not in, if you've not sold your soul to these big conglomerates, you're not going to reach anyone, mm. you know. But then there are people, you find people, don't you, in all these fields that have found a way of making the cottage industry work on their terms. All I ever wanted when I left big management in 2005 was to be able to get, you know, £10 a year off 3,000 people. That was sort of my, my dream. And I didn't have anything beyond that. And weirdly, once I shrunk it all down to that, mm. it actually started to, to work. But... I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it seems like the internet was supposed to set us free, but actually it's enslaving us on behalf of three or four big global corporations who are controlling the way our ideas are disseminated. And yeah. So I don't know. And I'm lucky that I'm part of a generation that got a foothold and had a little bit of mem- memory, people remembering you, from before you had to operate through all these systems. Thank you for answering that so honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 just fucking depressing, isn't it, basically? And I know, I mean, the last episode we had the stage of podcast was a band called Goldheart Assembly. Really, really fucking good band. And, you know, they've had to disband and go off and do different things yeah. because they're... You know, they're not making it so much. Well, it, you know, and, well, and they really. Change. I mean, there's a bad, like, not this is a mark approval, but yeah. someone like Mark Morrison and like Blue Tone said their music is, is, a, is his favourite song the last ten years, and like they're now disbanding, like they're yeah. just finishing, and it's because of that kind of whole thing. Well, it was all it was always like that in a way. I mean, <laughs> like, there was a band I loved as a teenager called the Moodists who were for Australia, and they were the same as the birth. They were in the same school as the birthday party Nick Cave's group. Mm. You couldn't really have said which one was better, but I loved the Moodists, and. Uh, the first time I saw them was in a pub in Oxford in uh, October 1986. There was 20 people there, and yet they'd been on the front of sounds and things like that, and they got four or five star reviews in places, and they were at John Peel sessions, and I mm. just didn't quite understand how that couldn't, you know, and I went and they did about 40 minutes, and I was kind of indignant. I'd been wanting to see them for years, and I finally got to see them, went on my own, I remember, walked across town in the dark to a place I'd never been before, and... Uh, I put my hand on the singer's shoulder at the end and went, why didn't you play this? Why didn't you play that? And he went, no one knows these songs, you know, like I've had to, they've half the people have gone home, you know. Then about a year later, I saw their guitarist in London loading gear into uh, the back of the Astoria for a much bigger Australian band, the Triffids, who were on Island mm. Records at the time. I went, you Steve Miller from the Moodis? He went, yeah, I went, what happened to the Moodis? Have you split up? And he went, we didn't split up. We just sort of stopped. Mm. And now I know Dave Graney from the Moodis really well. And he's one of my f- showbiz friends that I've met through showbiz. <laughs> and he, he said, yeah, I mean, they were washing dishes. They couldn't translate the 
critical acclaim into anything, and there does come a point where it's just not yeah. viable. But what he did, he went back to Australia, set up his own label, built a studio in the cellar of this place he got. He had one hit album, which was sort of misunderstood by Australia as a kind of kitsch, Mike Flowers sort of thing, I think. Mm -hmm. And he did well out of that one album. He won the, whatever the Brits is over there. Yeah. Put everything into buying this studio. Got, has got a website, distributes his own sort of stuff. Tours really low impact. Yeah. And um, is still making great records 20, 25 years later. I've heard Nick Cave talk about how Dave sort of saw what was happening ahead of the curve yeah, yeah, and worked out how to deal with it. Yeah. But he was still lucky in as much as there were people that remembered him before. And actually going full circle, he's got a new book out called Work Shy, which I don't know if it's available in Britain, but it is brilliant on being a working musician and by extension a working artist who's perhaps not a household name. It's very, very funny about having jobs, day jobs and people saying, oh, well, I might come and see your group then. Mm. And you're thinking, please just don't because <laughs> you'll hate it and then you'll be embarrassed yeah. and you'll think I'm mad, you know. Yeah. And it's like, it's a really, really funny book, Work, work Shy by Dave Graney. And he's, he's like, he's written two or three books and to me, he's been a big influence on me in terms of how he's, he's, he's a character on stage, he takes on different personas for different jobs, but his philosophy of being a working artist is bulletproof. It's mm. like, uh, it's got a kind of laconic detachment from what's happening, but he still manages to see his way through it. And he's, he's also satisfied himself that he is brilliant, and he is, whether the world recognises it or not. And that enables him to be brilliant. And we saw him on his last British tour in the cellar of the pub, of the Betty Trotwood, Betsy Trotwood pub in Clerkenwell. The cellar was full, admittedly. Yeah. It was still the cellar of a pub. And yet, he could have, he did it like he was a Wembley. I mean, nice. it was like, he just, he's thought himself into this space where he's escaped all judgment. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your wisdom, your insight. Um, you. true, it's, true, it's truly superb show. Concept Bride is running between now um, and the end of April. And you're, yeah. you, you're currently doing stuff in London, then you're going off all around. I've got the UK, two right? weeks or more in London. I've got touring around in February, March, and April, and then it finally will expire um, uh, over three dates at the Royal Festival Hall at the end of April. Nice. Which are, I need people to go to those, actually. If anyone wants to go, you'd be doing me a favour. <laughs> Get Along, it's a great show, I've seen it a couple of times, and uh, Stuart's body of work, DVDs, downloads, music reviews, books, all available at stuartlee.co.uk. Um, thank you so much for appearing on the Stage Left podcast. I should mention that Capri Battery song is available on their band camp, I think that's it as well, yeah. so get, uh, get on there. Um, thanks for appearing on the Stage Left podcast, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. For more episodes featuring the likes of Billy Burnett of Fleetwood Mac, Steve Cropper of Booker T and the MGs, Gem Archer of Oasis, uh, Russ Pritchard and Mikey Rowe of Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds, uh, Ezra Furman, uh, Danny Goffey of Supergrass, uh, Abby Harding of the Zootons um, and Jennifer Batten on what it was like touring for a decade with Michael Jackson uh, and loads more, uh, go to thestagechefpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at the Stage of Pod, like us at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Stage of Podcast um, and like our Instagram page because you'll see all the photos from the interviews and, and behind the scenes stuff on there too. Uh, we'll see you next month for Ian Dench.